Hi, I'm Yasmin and I'm in beautiful Coles Bay about to kick off another awesome episode of Last Drinks Tasmania. All aboard. Today I'm on Tasmania's legendary east coast and what better way to see it than with a cruise along the spectacular coastline of Freycinet National Park. The Wineglass Bay cruise is a four and a half hour journey from Coles Bay to Wineglass Bay. It operates daily and what you see depends a little on the weather and season but today I think I'm in luck. The peninsula was once the exclusive domain of the Paitarama people, the Oyster Bay tribe. For some 30,000 years, they lived here off the bounty of the sea and the forest. In fact, some of the tracks are paths walked by the original inhabitants thousands of years ago. The peninsula takes its name from the brothers de Freycinet, Louis-Claude and Louis-Henry. In 1802, these French explorers, at war with the English, sailed the southern coast of mainland Australia and Van Diemen's Land, eventually publishing the first map to show the continent's coastline in full. In the 1820s, whalers came to Wineglass Bay. For 20 years, they would explore the bay in small boats, harpooning nearby whales for bones and oil to be exported to Britain for lighting. During this time, the soft blue waters stained red with blood came to resemble a glass of red wine. And so the bay acquired its iconic name. By the 1850s, the whalers had moved on, but then came sheep and cattle grazing and coal and tin mining. Degradation of the environment continued until 1916 when the peninsula was declared a national park. The granite coastline is so iconic and unique to the east coast of Tasmania, with its orange lichen giving it that distinct glow. We've just come in for a nice quick close look at the big cliffs and the caves and the, and the granite, and we're just about to head into Wineglass Bay very shortly. As well as the caves and waterfalls along the coast, there's plenty to see in the water. These dolphins came right up to our bow to wave hello. Check out this rocky outpost full of seabirds and seals. If you're keen for whales, it's best to come from September to December and May to July. The cruise's destination is the tranquil water of Wineglass Bay. What more could you want? How about a box lunch and a cheeky wine? On the way back, we were joined by a flock of mutton birds and even more dolphins. Before our trip ended, I went up to meet the captain and maybe have a little sail of the boat. Hi, Matt. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Excellent, thank you. Yeah. You're the captain of 
the ship? Yes, yes, yeah. skipper of the vessel. And what's your favourite part of the job? Uh, my favourite part of the job is driving the boat. Yeah. <laughs> it's and, an important uh, part. It is, yeah. yeah. And obviously meeting different people every day and dealing with different weather. I, I just love being on the ocean, so it's, um, yeah. it's all very exciting, yeah. yeah. Uh, best time of the year to do one of these cruises? Well, depending on what you want, weather or whales. So the weather would be around autumn and the whales migrate in mid-October they started this year. So Okay. Yeah, so yeah, well, cool. winter's nice, sunny days on the east coast, so yeah, all, all year yeah. really. Alright, yeah. anytime. You're always going to get something. Anytime. Okay Matt, my turn. And what um, you're going to do is get yeah. as straight as possible. Straight the way. Okay, yeah, well. I won't listen. <laughs> and they're going to wonder what's oh. going on. <laughs> So you want to go, just keep that nice straight line. You've just got to correct it. Okay, so you're yeah. basically just correcting it the whole time. Just taking a, giving Captain Matt a bit of a break from... A bit of a break or a lesson? Yeah. <laughs> 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 well. well, I think I nailed that. It's not just the scenery that made the journey so pleasant. The crew were very friendly and helpful too. You and you're one of the crew members on board here. How long have you been doing it for? Uh, so on this vessel about 18 months and working for Pentecost Wilderness Journeys for a little bit shorter than that. So, okay, yeah. love it. Yeah, absolutely love it. So. And something that I noticed, you guys are very attentive. Um, even our director was feeling a little bit queasy and now I didn't notice anybody else feeling sick at the time so it could have been him just not wanting to work but you guys were on the ball yeah. straight away really attentive really quick to action yeah it's always unpredictable and I guess for us the biggest thing is if you're not you know if you're not feeling too well or if you're not too comfortable then obviously you're not really able to have the best experience so yeah for us it's really important that if people are comfortable uh, people are reassured and uh, yeah, I guess we've got a lot of a lot of good tricks, uh, I guess like your director and he uh, he took the advice and I reckon we uh, managed to show him a pretty good time regardless. Yeah, so, yeah. definitely. So thank you so much for having us. Oh, uh, that's alright. My pleasure. Thank Thanks you. for having me. I love this area of Tasmania and I'd love to go for a hike to a secluded beach, but I have to hit the road for Hobart via another distillery, of course. Whilst filming Last Drinks Tasmania in Hobart, our crew chose to stay at The Lodge on Elizabeth, centrally located within a short walk to the central shopping precinct, restaurants, pubs, and the historic Hobart CBD. Experience the grace and grandeur of this stately Georgian mansion. The Lodge on Elizabeth is elegant heritage accommodation. All rooms have their own ensuite, with the larger, more luxurious rooms featuring spas, four-poster, half-tester, or antique beds. To book your stay at The Lodge on Elizabeth, visit thelodge.com.au. Before I head down to Hobart, I'm stopping by Springvale Vineyard just outside Coles Bay and current home to the Splendid Gin. I'm meeting owners Mike and Ange, an endlessly creative couple who met on Tasmania's east coast. Previously, Mike was a designer in London and Ange lived in Nashville, recording and performing music. When the couple met in Tasmania, it was only a matter of time until something splendid happened. We lived uh, overseas for over a decade. We were based in England and me partially between England and Nashville. And um, after however many years we came home, we wanted to start a family. Came back to Tasmania and uh, based ourselves on the east coast of Tasmania because it's our favourite part of the island. And um, we soon, pretty pretty quickly, met um, Kel and Tim, our business partners, who uh, own their family-owned Springvale Wines. And um, the interesting part of our connection, as well as being really good friends and clicking straight away, is that we both live in old estates that were inhabited by the famous novelist and painter of the local flora and fauna, and her name was uh, Louisa Ann Meredith. Okay. And Louisa lived in our house at Riversdale down the yeah. road, which is an old flour mill estate, and whilst she was having Springvale built for her in the 1840s. So we're currently in the stables, the old stables, and right. pretty much most of this building is original, which is absolutely amazing, and it's got a lot of the old paraphernalia from, from days gone by when it was the stables. And then the Lyon family who own Springvale Wines, they with, uh, they became the custodians of this property from 1875 through to today. Mm. So it's a long lineage. So yeah, we just thought, what 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 can we do together? What enter enterprise? You know, what's something fun that we exactly. can do? Uh -huh. exactly. And gin, 
Jeans was the answer. answer. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. It kind of just, yeah, it evolved. I mean, kind of almost serendipitously, really. We, we went out one night, well, several nights, but one, one night in particular, and tried lots of different jeans, and we just didn't quite find one that we all agreed had that that taste that we wanted. Mm. So we mm. thought, well, how about we have a crack at doing it ourselves? Yep. And and here we are today. <laughs> exactly yeah. right. You did it. Yeah. Just your ordinary couple setting out to make the perfect gin. I think I better taste. This is our flagship uh, splendid gin. So it's 42%. And all, all three of them are made with that grape spirit. And this one is it has that citrus leaning, as Mike just said. It's got the bergamot, yep. and it really particularly has a mandarin leaning. Okay. Actually, and um, yeah, which is which is really beautiful. You have a little try. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> so keep in mind that that's forty-two percent alcohol. Um, it is. It's but it's so still smooth. Yeah. Mm, mm. Yep. And that's that quadruple distillation that really kind of softens down that profile. Yeah. yeah. It's quite it's refined. Whereas, you know, some people actually choose to go for that more grainy mm -hmm. sort of style of the, yeah, the old absolutely. old style. We'd we'd describe this as more of your new world gin. Yeah. So. Yeah, and the citrus definitely lingers as well. Yes. Those, those flavours. Yeah, definitely. So it makes a yeah. really great gin tea. Which you're about to try. I'm <laughs> looking forward to this one. Yeah. So here at Springvale, um, which is the, the winery uh, and vineyard for Springvale wines, we have the we use the water from their spring, the natural spring, and so we figured that that's definitely the, the purity side of things. <laughs> and then um, the obscurity is that well, things become more obscure perhaps as the night or <laughs> afternoon goes on. <laughs> So this is with a tonic Cheese. and some orange. Yeah. Yes. That is very refreshing. Mm. It is. It is. <laughs> uh, we're very happy with that. That's it's beautiful. Good. Yeah. And yeah. It, I, I guess the, it came about through not really tasting the ultimate gin that we all collectively like. Mm. Um, and we saw a bit of an opportunity to kind of make something that we all really enjoy drinking. And um, uh -huh. I guess that's how, how it was born. Yeah. We, we, we sort of spent some time drinking different gins and certainly having a good time. Uh -huh. And, and um, one night, collectively, we definitely got through quite a few and, and just didn't quite hit the note. You know, that je ne sais quoi that we were thinking perhaps could be still invented. So we invented it. You did. And that's what the Splendid is. And, um, you know, the day we, were, we actually designed the recipe, we had such a great day and we were all on the same page. So it came together really quickly. Yeah, and just had fun while doing it. Totally. Indeed. It's always got to be about fun. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we live in such a beautiful part of the world, a very relaxed part of the world, and, you know, we're just adding that little extra ingredient of, um, you know, to make even more fun yeah. on top of the fun You've we You've got to enjoy have. what you do. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mike has a bit of a different take on gin distillation. He uses grapes and distills four times for his extra smooth base spirit. I think all of our skill sets had kind of collided in a way and so um, it, was, uh, it was a really nice match to kind of actually start to develop something and a lot of fun to kind of create something that we're all very proud of. Mm. We know it's a quality product, you know, it's of the place and it's really quite a, uh, a nice thing to kind of start to build and then advocate and share with other people. So, and you know, it's, it's good fun. It's a fun industry to be in. Yeah. Yep. It's uh, certainly growing and evolving. It's felt like a very natural kind of process to go, fall into and um, it, it, it's so far so good and we're really enjoying the process and the journey so you know, totally. long may it continue. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Certainly. There's definitely a romance and a magic in the air up here. It's, it's, uh, we're both from Hobart originally and we've always owned a, a little bit of land in some way, shape or form. Um, it's very pretty but it's wild at the same yes. time, you know, you are out in the elements and and so, and, and the beaches, you know, every beach, even though they might be side by side, they're all different. They all have their mm. different character about mm. them. One might have really white fine sand, another one's a bit more grainy. It's really fantastic and it's certainly a wonderful place to, to have a family. Just the quality of the environment, you know, it's a very clean, pristine environment. I think I'm getting closer to discovering why this side of Tasmania is so special. So we've got the Summer Cup. 
which um, we saw a bit of a gap in the market here, in, actually in Australia, more of that sort of, it's a fruit cup, more of a, a pim sort of style. Okay. So whereas this one, the flagship, um, is 42%, this sits at 25%. And okay. that's um, mixed with it, so it's our, it's our gin in it, but then it's put with a mixer of um, different things, including orange peel and roasted dandelion root, and some really interesting, and Tasmanian mountain pepper berry, so, uh -huh. which is a really unique to Tasmania. Um, berry yeah. and yeah and have a little taste it's so we mix that down with either lemonade or soda water if you don't like it quite so sweet and then all sorts of summer fruits yeah and okay citruses make and a big jug mint of it. Yeah, yeah it's really good for sharing with your friends okay. it's worth um, tasting just neat okay yeah so you can understand that profile yeah beautiful color yeah i mean that's great mm. Mm. Yeah. like that you yeah, can drink no. it just straight up like that, absolutely, and it, I mean, that's the versatility of that. Absolutely. Like it can mm. be an aperitif, a, a nightcap, yep. you know, it's got that versatility. And you can also use it, we, make, we mix up a Negroni instead of using a Campari. Uh -huh. We use the summer cup. Use this one. Yeah, mm. it's got a bit more viscosity to it. Mm -hmm. It does. Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, it's more yeah. almost like a liqueur. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh, here we go. <laughs> yep, this is when the party begins. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, you can just mix it up as a, you know, as a big, big fruity cup, basically. I mean, oh, that's yeah. kind of light. Lemonade you're putting in there. Yeah, that's yeah. lemonade, but I mean, you can dilute it down with soda, ginger ale, really doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of just a taste preference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would happen. The thing that I love most is the mint. Because I yeah. think it just really cuts through that kind of a caramel. I can smell that mint. Toffee, yeah, profile, and it's just... It also presents really well in bath, so you know, it's really kind of colourful. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll give you a, a little taster of that. Please do. Um, and see what you think of that. And you'll probably just it'll really open up that kind of profile. Okay. Mm. That is mm. delicious. It's yummy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very popular. It's great. That's lovely. There's so much history and natural beauty in this place. I can see why these globetrotters now call it home. The winery that we're on, the grounds are amazing. Got really beautiful views over there. Absolutely. I mean, the whole East Coast is quite stunning, really, and we've always loved it, always been drawn to the East Coast, keep coming back for our sins. I mean, there's a lot of history here, a lot of history. And I mean, Springvale that we're on now, I think uh, it's around 1840s, early 40s. Your philosophy at the Splendid Gin is keep it splendid. Keep it splendid, absolutely. Most definitely. I guess on a more serious note, it's, it's all about the quality. We know we want to really make quality gin and spirits. And I think Tasmania is doing an excellent job at doing that generally. Um, we really will not put out anything unless we think it's absolutely perfect mm -hmm. and it tells a bit of a story about the actual place that it's from. Like wine, but you know, gin I think is doing very similar things. So. Since we've been going, which just over four years, I mean, it's probably quadrupled, I'd say. Maybe not wow. in Tasmania, but I think generally over Australia, there would be, I'd say at least four times, maybe more. And I mean, there's whiskey distilleries, there's rum distilleries, there's distilleries popping up all over the place. But I mean, I think that's a positive thing for the industry generally. Yeah. We, we don't see it as competition. I think we see it as the opposite of that. It's a, it's a great thing to be involved in and everybody is learning. And through that collective learning, we can only create better better products at the end of the day. So that's really exciting. It's also made Tasmania a go-to destination for anyone who appreciates a fine spirit. Speaking of which, Time for one more, the distiller's strength. Now that leads on to the okay. mesmeric, which is our distiller's strength. It's not quite a navy strength, which sits higher in the 50s, sort of. Um, and whereas this one is 50%, um, so it does have a lot more grunt compared to the standard one, okay. but it's the same flavour profile, just, um, just with a bit more weight to it. So where we'd use this typically for a G&T, the standard yep. one, we use the mesmeric for a martini or for cocktails. Okay. Um, which it, and it's perfect. It's just got that really fantastic amount of uh, balance. Probably not for plain hearted drinking. <laughs> it's uh, worth a go. Let's we'll see how we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Hmm. Almost expecting the burn and that sort of fiery ethanol kind of. Yeah. But it's not there. No. But 
the, no. with the flavour it is. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And again, it, it does, it, it lingers. I mean, you, you know about it, but it's got that beautiful flavour profile. Yeah, that's still 100%. Mm. So you've got, and it's got a little bit more of that juniper in there, just a bit more of everything. Yeah, right. Yeah. We would, as a garnish, we tend to lean towards uh, orange in the summertime and mandarin as a garnish in the wintertime. Okay. And we don't, we don't pull it out as pieces, we still slice it like you would an orange or a, or, a, or a lemon. Yeah, we slice it and it's really, it's perfect yeah, in the wintertime okay. when mandarins are in season. Yeah. I wish I could spend all day with these two, but I need to get to Hobart so it's time to leg it down the coast. While swimming last drinks Tasmania, our crew chose to stay at the Henry Jones Art Hotel. At the Henry Jones, history and art collide. Hobart's oldest waterfront warehouses have been thoughtfully reimagined as Australia's first dedicated art hotel. Located in the Hunter Street precinct, the hotel blends modernity with an industrial past. Decadent elliptical spas bubble underneath rough sawn timber trusses. Blackwood lined boardrooms have been refashioned into stately, indulgent accommodation suites. To book your stay at the Henry Jones Art Hotel, head to thehenryjones.com. English settlement came to Hobart in 1804, fed by thriving whaling and sealing industries and a steady supply of convict labour. Today, I'm in the Old Wharf area of Sullivan's Cove. I spent the night in the iconic Henry Jones Art Hotel. And it's time for breakfast. I've managed to find a pretty good looking breakfast spot. It is the Atrium, which is right next door to the Henry Jones Art Hotel. I'm gonna dig into my avocado on toast before gonna to check out Hobart for the day. First, I'm meeting the manager, Matt Casey, to learn some history. It's been here operating as a hotel since 2004. Basically, when we took it on back in that stage, um, other developers were looking to level the site or at least keep the facade, but not keep the building that you see yeah. today. So between ourselves, the developers, and the architect uh, by the name of Robert Morris Nunn, he lobbied very hard to actually retain every component of the building because of its historic value. Uh -huh. uh, and in doing so, he's very sensitively um, integrated a hotel. He's only cut five beams out of the seven buildings that make up Henry Jones. Quite amazing. The whaling industry had collapsed and this wharf was gripped by poverty and pollution from factories and slaughterhouses. Slums proliferated and the buildings of the old wharf fell into disrepair. But in 1869, businessman George Peacock moved his successful jam making business to the old wharf and re-established it as the best location in Hobart for exporting produce. Uh, it was the largest privately owned company in the whole of Australia. Tasmania was known for many, many years as the Apple Isle and that came from the fruit picking um, industry that grew up because of the growth of the jam making factory. At 12 years of age, Henry Jones began working at the Peacock's Jam Factory. After working his way up from sticking labels to jam tins, Henry eventually rose to take over the business. The average lifespan of people living in this area was th to, to the age of 35. Um, it was a red light district, then it was a jam factory. Um, and then when we took it on, it had been derelict for 40 years. Hobart used to smell of jam, like the whole of Hobart actually used right. to smell of jam because of this two and a half thousand people making jam right here, almost you know, on the waterfront of Hobart. Uh, we had up to 40 squatters, you know, living in these old buildings. It was completely derelict. To see it as a beautiful hotel now, yeah. I mean, it's such, you know, I was so proud of what the architect did. It was incredible. We give a really deep experience of Hobart through the hotel. Check out this staircase. Henry Jones had just won the contract to supply jam to the British in the Boer War and his workers had built this as a present. He walked up the staircase, they greeted him and presented it to them. He said, what a terrible frippery, was his comment. Like, what a waste of money. Right. And you can see here where they're just, they almost finished it off but didn't quite finish it. You can see the rough scribing there. Yeah. And how this is smooth there and it hasn't, they haven't finished etching it. Okay. He made them stop work immediately on it. They only had an hour or two hours worth of work to do it's to like, finish it. Don't bother. He said, that's it. Talk about a tough boss. And this was the top room, and this was where all the accountants were and the management were, and there's actually secret safes. You can push on some of the partitions, the wall gives way, and no. there's, there's a secret safe behind one of them in one of the rooms. <laughs> Five workers actually worked together on the same production line for over 50 years and didn't move. 
Like they came to work for 50 years and they went, this is my job. And g'day Martha, g'day Bob, g'day thing. And they, they did that for 50 years wow. and didn't work their position. So it's almost unheard of today. It's unheard of today. <laughs> Downstairs is the beautiful restaurant Landscape featuring the work of John Glover. It's highly collectible. It's very prestigious sort of work. And John Glover was um, arguably the person that started colonial art in Tasmania. It also features the winners of the John Glover Art Prize. We have a model where um, we're really trying to connect people deeply and connect them with the place. Tassie and Hobart and art and the quirkiness of just Tassie. It's hard being an artist, you know, it's not really a commercial type thing. We really wanted to lift the profile of these artists that are coming out of the University Art School that we were getting to know really, really quite well, um, yet they're finding it hard to establish them themselves. So, we're one of the biggest galleries in um, Tasmania. There's over 400 art pieces here and, you know, we, we, it's all about lifting that profile of Tasmanian artists. Amin Lewis is the hotel's art curator. Who better to show me around? We're very lucky. We've got so many uh, incredible artists here down in Tassie. We can't go door knocking to look in the rooms at all the works. <laughs> but um, yeah, we'll go along the corridor and I'll, I'll, I'll show you a few key pieces. Yeah, great. Yeah. The Henry Jones is Australia's first dedicated art hotel. They exhibit contemporary artworks by both emerging and established Tasmanian artists. This place is prolific. There are some 400 artworks on display throughout the rooms and suites, not to mention the bar and restaurants. Our artists range from um, landscape painters uh, right through to some of our street artists. Um, this is a good example. This is a piece by Jarman. Um, so if you're walking around the streets of Hobart, you'll see a lot of work by Jarman okay. um, up the alleyways. Yeah. And interestingly, to see the progression of the artists, we've got some um, more current works by Jarman. So on this wall over here, you can see ah, how much his style... the same artist. Same artist. You can see how his style has changed up. Still working with spray paints, but um, he's using stencils to tightly control the application of paint. And he's working on aluminium panels to give a really flush finish. The artist is a vet what and she's an animal rights activist. Okay. Um, so what she's done Very here is she, she took animals and she put human features on them. So in this case it's a frog and she's put her hands on the frog, her eyes and her flesh tones. There are also plenty of Tassie landscapes too. To encourage Tasmania's rising contemporary art scene, the hotel offers the $20,000 Henry Jones Art Prize. And check out this one by Nigel Hewitt. It's made out of wood ash from the Tarkine Forest. After a fire in the area, Hewitt collected all these different shades of wood ash to sprinkle on each canvas before sealing it in place. There's so much to see here, I wish I could see it all, but it's time for me to move on and see what else this city has to offer. I'm loving my time here in Hobart and there is still so much more for me to go discover. So I'm gonna go do just that and I'll see you next time. Next week, I check out the Salamanca markets, visit the great folks at Bonnerong Wildlife Sanctuary, have a frank cider or two, and go for a sail on the Huon River.